our goal was to make sure that we inform the young Iranians in, in London and their parents uh, and other Iranians that may be interested um, about the history of medicine going back 1100 years right the way to today. Um, in Iran, over the past centuries, um, there's been lots of change. There's been lots of invasions. There's been lots of metamorphosis. And in each time these things have happened, Iranians have been very good at adapting to the situation, uh, adapting. Um, their, as, a, as a nation, we're quite impressionable. And the, the, the classic example is medicine, how when medicine pretty much was in, introduced in Iran, uh, our forefathers, Al-Razi, Abu Sina, they um, exported the whole thing to the Indo-Asia and all the nearby countries. And then different things have happened over the centuries and we didn't have enough time to touch it today. But really, when we had the past 30, 40 years of turmoil in Iran and a group of Iranians left Iran, again, you, the example today was to show how people have adapted, how they have uh, learned the language, they have uh, excelled in whichever culture that they've been accepted in, um, and they've, they've invented, pioneered, uh, and they now are world names. So the aim was just to let people know how good we were a hundred thousand years ago, and really the story continues, and we wanted to sow a seed within our youth, um, almost like a mutation, and tell them, look, if we can sow this seed and let this mutation become a positive tumor, and for you to really grow and learn to excel in academia, in medicine, in engineering, in IT, and uh, really raise the flag of being Iranian, alive for years to come. I definitely, I think we have reached a goal. I think my highlight for today was how in the morning the historians who really have a tough job to uh, keep the, um, the young people uh, interested, you know, because their attention span is limited, a lot of the kids that came here. And I was very impressed with some of the historians, how they ignited, you know, they, they were able to um, tell the young people about what happened without those people losing attention. The afternoon, I mean, it was incredible because I think everyone uh, was on the uh, edge of their seats. Each and every one of the speakers could have multiplied their speech time four or five-fold. Time was a massive constraint, uh, but I was not disappointed with any of them. Uh, and obviously our keynote speaker uh, just spoke volumes and it really excited me and I'm sure it excited a lot of our young members today. Um, my name is John Curtis, and I'm the um, CEO of the Iran Heritage Foundation, or IHF, as it's uh, uh, popularly known. And it's our very great pleasure today to be collaborating with the British Iranian Medical Association, BIMA, in the organization of what promises to be uh, a very, very interesting conference on Iran's medical heritage. It gives me great, great pleasure to be standing here uh, before you, uh, representing uh, BIMA, um, an organization which, uh, although still its infancy, has uh, punched above its weight in its informative years. Uh, the event today, which is a culmination of uh, six months of hard collaborative work and preparation, is no exception. You've got a fascinating lectures and of course first-class speakers and I'm sure you will all have a wonderful time. I also hope that you'll spend a little time looking at the history and the paintings and the artifacts which are dotted around this building giving the history of surgery in England. We have more than a thousand manuscripts in Manchester that uh, lie there uncatalogued and we, we have now just completed the pilot uh, phase which was uh, supported by the foundation 
And uh, we are now moving on to another phase supported by the British Institu uh, Institute of uh, Persian Studies. And we really hope that uh, this great collection of Persian manuscripts will one, one day be fully catalogued and uh, be fully discoverable. But you know, so Arrazi, for instance, uh, writes about uh, patients and uh, notes the, the details of how he treated melancholy, how he treated headaches, how he treated this, that, and the other. And obviously, these things, these observations sometimes resonate uh, um, with one personally. But um, in the case of uh, Avicenna, what impresses me most is uh, his incredible ability to master a huge tradition, a huge body of knowledge. Uh, this man must have had, you know, total recall of information and has this enormous and gigantic mind that uh, is, makes him the greatest philosopher and possibly also the greatest physician or at least summarizer of uh, medicine in the medieval period. Uh. Yeah. There are two points uh, I'd like to address uh, with regard to this uh, particular text. And I noticed that the conference organizers cleverly selected uh, an illustration uh, here from this particular text uh, as the, the, the logo, as it were, of this very interesting and important conference. The first of the points I'd like to make talks about the understanding of illness and wellness in the medieval Islamic world. And in the course of the, this issue in particular, I'm going to discuss, of course, the anatomical illustrations. Well, the Tashriha Mansuri, the text itself is important for two reasons. One for the illustrations, <clears throat> which accompany the text, but also for the actual text itself and how it reveals that Ibn Ilyas in this period uh, is having access to a balance of different views about issues of medical, about illness and wellness. So he is uh, having uh, in the text uh, recourse both to Galenic medicine or Hellenic, Hellenistic traditions of humoral medicine, which looks at uh, uh, equilibrium and balance and such of the four humors, the black bile, the yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. But at the same time, he is also using recourse to what we call Tiba Nabavi, Okay, or Tiba, uh, prophetic tradition, prophetic medicine. So are we going to talk about medical practice in Iran? Now, I'll limit myself to the Qajar period. And in fact, there were three kinds of medical practice in Iran. First was, let's say, what is generally known as Tiba Yunani, the Galenic tradition. The two previous speakers have dealt with it. I'm not going into that. But it's also, I think, the, the, the type of medical tradition that gets most uh, attention, and why? Because the practitioners wrote books. What you have to realize, um, when we talk, let's say, about the change in Iran um, uh, that came about basically because of the defeats that it suffered against the wars with Russia. Mm. And um, so what you see then, especially after the first, that Abbas Mirza said, look, and not only Abis Mirza, there were a lot of people, a lot of people in the elite, who said, "Look, you know, um, if we want to beat uh, the Russians, we need to adopt their methods." Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. The Iran-Iraq War began in September 1980, and ended in August 1988, lasting 2,887 days. During these eight years of war, about 70 Iranians were killed daily. The war was one of the longest conflicts in the 20th century. نه متاسفانه هم آماری که من در مورد مرگ و میر و صدماتی که الان در صحبت هم گفتم خدمتون مطمئن هستم که آمار واقعی خیلی بیشتر از این است همین حدود یکی دو هفته پیش حدود دویست سی صد نفر قواس هایی که دستون بسته بودن و در آوردن اینا اصلا در این آماره نبوده همین جوری سالهای سال چیزهای جدیدی در میاد اینایی هم که معلول این جنگ هستن فراوون هستن از این 400 500 هزار نفری که صدمه دیدن همه اینا احتیاج به مراقبت اینا دارن به احتمال به نظرم میاد که سیستم های چیز اجتماعی نسبتا خوبی براشون درست کردن اینی که چون از هیته کار ما پزشکایی که تو بخش خصوصی هستیم 
خارج هست نمیدونم چطوری با اینا رفتار میشه به نظرم که اینا به احتیاج به مراقبت های از نظر سایکولوژی از نظر فیزیکی از نظر خانوادگی احتیاج هست بهشون بشه چقدر بهشون میشه از گوش و کنار میشنون که مراکزی هستش که برای اینا وجود داره ولی از اون خدمات واقعی در چه حدی هست چون گزارش شفافی نداشتیم یا اینکه من نخوندم خبر ندارم Hence, we've worked really hard at the advent of a field called vascularized composite transplantation. And that is a transplant different than the transplant that you're used to. You're used to hearing about kidneys, hearts, lungs, liver. These are solid organ transplants. What I'm talking to you about is composite transplants, meaning that they involve all layers of tissues. That includes uh, skin, muscle, ligament, bone, nerve, lymph nodes, um, tendons, joints, and cartilages. And the hand com uh, characterized as a com composite transplant. So is uh, so are faces and other things. The current state of transplantation of limbs, hands, arms, and even faces, is that we can do them technically. So the technical feats of putting the nerves together, the bones together, the muscles together, the arteries and veins together, and securing the skin have already been established. The real limitations now to have wider exposure to the, the broader good is really two things. One is nerve regeneration, to make the nerves work more reliably. And really the other one is the rejection issues that we, we face. Because this is tissues taken from somebody else, rejection is of prime importance, immunology is of prime importance. So that the patients that undergo these procedures have to be on lifelong anti-rejection medications. So the importance of the future to make this broadly accessible is that we have to figure out a way to mitigate the effects of the medications to make it safer and change the risks benefits ratio towards the benefits and less towards the risks. And this is an active area of our concentration in many, many laboratories around the world that are trying to work on this. According to a Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, USA, more people suffer from hearing, speech, and language impairment than heart disease, than blindness, than TB, MS, epilepsy, all kinds of the muscular dystrophies. My life as a neurosurgeon now we go together, we make a journey together. Whatever I have uh, experiences around the world and inclusive also Iran. Iran should always inc be included. If you take into consideration the time that I had suddenly the opportunity to do a surgery which normally around the world uh, not was as a normal procedure and I had to do it in my home country as I was there for education young uh, doctors in microsurgery and that was of course something very very special and historical you can imagine 1971 it is 45 years ago still in Europe also this procedure was not able to do it. And, uh, and so this has been done uh, successfully in Tehran, in the city where I, I was born. You know. And this is, of course, a very uh, important from many aspects. One aspect is that in my uh, uh, hometown, uh, this has happened. Second, it is one of the most actual important development of surgery, which was replantation, was done in that time in Iran. I thought I'd start by giving you um, the classic definition for um, genetic epidemiology. It's a fairly new discipline, first defined in 1978 
um, as a science that deals with the etiology, distribution, and control of disease in groups of relatives. And in order to find out the frequency of that mutation, we have to ascertain more families with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer and test them for this genetic mutation. And we have not done that. We have not completed our genetic abuse study, so yeah. I work for UCL and I base at Royal Free Hospital, Department of Surgery. I've been there quite a long time. And I, I know the surgeon gave an excellent talk today. And I'm really trying to make some tools for them so they enhance their you know, reconstructive surgery. I work on uh, um, uh, nanotechnology and stem cell. So with nanotechnology, I work on development of organ, you know, human organ, like ear, nose, trachea, and so on, you know. So we synthesize, we make material like a plastic you could put inside the body. The material based on nanotechnology, so it's very small, you know, like a nanotechnology, and we print it, we do 3D printer. For example, if you want to ear, we, tr we print 3D, and then we take pay blood from patient or fat from patient, separate the stem cell, incorporate it into scaffold, this 3D scaffold, and then we implant it under the skin. And that takes maybe about eight weeks. Then the surgeon, plastic surgeon, will cut it and move it on the ear. So that's my work. I, uh, you know, some of the stuff already gone to human, our trachea, blood vessel, you know, tear duct, um, and, uh, and noses on the construction. And I remember third year medical school, I had this patient that uh, had GI bleeding, was bleeding through the gut, out of the rectum, and this went on for two, three days. We gave the patient, I believe, 27 units of blood. And I was a medical student. Patient was uh, scoped from up, down, everywhere. We gave blood, blood, blood. Patient blood pressure was falling down. And patient was too sick to go to surgery. And somebody had this idea to call this radiologist to come in and see the patient. So this guy came in Friday night, 8 PM. Did this quick procedure, went from the growing a hole, only a few millimeters, no cuts, no stitches, found the bleeder, which is, this was not that same patient, but similar to a little bleeder, put little things there, went home, said patient is not going to bleed anymore. I was like, wow, who was this guy? Uh, stroke is the leading cause of disability, or the second leading cause of disability in most countries. So if we can get patients to the right place in the right time, we can decrease disability probably by half. We can have at least twice number of people surviving a stroke that could be functioning part of society. And we have proven that in many trials within that came out this year. Well, it's a very interesting subject among many others, of course. Um, the Iranian contribution to so many different aspects of civilization and science and uh, knowledge generally. Uh, I mean, I knew a little bit about it, but of course not in any detail, and I'm not a medical person myself. Um, but it's very interesting to see how um, Iranian science and knowledge has embraced uh, traditions from other cultures. I think it's obviously very important that there's this sort of continuity, which is what several of the speakers were talking about so far, you know, these medical conditions and the way of dealing with them, it goes back a very long way, of course, because the whole of humanity suffers from illnesses. Uh, and so in, in the particular case of Iran, how as a, a great culture and a great civilization, how they've absorbed uh, knowledge from previous generations and previous traditions and contributed to that themselves, as in other fields, and then, of course, have put that back into what you might call the general knowledge for other people to use, and I'm sure modern-day Iranian doctors, and of course many of them are here, are, are developing new techniques building on the legacy of the past. And I think a, a subject like medicine, which is not really specific to any, you know, it's not a... Um, uh, the, uh, for any one person. I mean, it's not just theirs. This is for all humanity. And I guess some diseases and illnesses are specific to particular parts of the world. But in general, 
uh, you know, we're talking about a tradition that isn't particular to any one person, and so it's interesting to see how uh, Persian scholars in the past and in the contemporary world have contributed to, you know, the general welfare of mankind and, you know, how um, things can develop and improve.